In this series of videos, we're going to examine monetary pulse, which is conducted by our central bank, the Federal Reserve. Now money is anything that is regularly used in exchange. Sellers demand money for their goods, but not everyone has demand for all goods. So that's why barter systems don't work very well. A seller accepts it because she believes when she needs it in the future to buy goods and services for her business or her, or her household, it would be accepted by sellers of those goods and services. A buyer holds and uses it because she believes the seller of a good or a service will accept it. It is a unit of account, that is, prices are quoted in terms of money. It serves as a store of value, even though it may not be a perfect store of value. <laughs> Here are some examples of money. Gold, silver, pots, big stones, wine, cigarettes, and coat checks. <laughs> Here's a picture of money on the island of Yap. Here's another picture of money from Siam. Here we have two bills. The top one is a $5 gold note. And the bearer of this note could go to the United States Gold Bank of San Francisco and give the bank this $5 note in exchange for $5 in gold coin. The bottom bill is the front and back of a $10 gold note. And the bearer of that note, the person holding that note in their wallet, could go to the United States National Gold Bank and turn that note in for $10 in gold coin. Now these notes, this $5 note and the $10 note, are kind of like the receipt you get from the coat check person at a nightclub. When you go into the club, you're wearing a big coat, it's kind of inconvenient to wear it because one, it's hot in the club. And two, if you, if you take it off and you leave it at a chair and you go on the dance floor, somebody might take off with it. So what you do is you typically uh, give it to the coat check person who then gives you a receipt. And that receipt is like one of these notes. And your coat is like the gold that is in the bank. Carrying around the receipt is very convenient, much like carrying around one of these notes. It's more convenient to carry one of these notes than $10 in gold coin or $5 in gold coin. This is paper money in 1922. Notice it says $10 in gold coin, payable to the bearer on demand. So in 1922, you could take this $10 bill to the Federal Reserve and they would give you $10 in gold coin. On the back, it actually says a gold certificate. The United States of America, $10. And notice it's kind of a gold color. Here is a $1 bill in 1957. It says in very, very small font, $1 in silver payable to the bearer on demand. Now you have to look really hard, so you have to zoom in on it. Now what's interesting here is if we go back in time, here the thing is in gold. It looks like it's made of gold coin. Um, the color is gold. It's got gold all over it. Gold there, gold there, gold there. Gold's printed all over these bills. By 1922, Gold is in smaller font on the front, and on the back it's in pretty small font, but the color on the back is kind of the uh, same color as gold. Now by 1957, we have silver here, we have silver here, but the font's very, very small. Now if you compare this bill to one that's in your wallet, you're not going to see gold or silver on the paper. But you will see in God we trust. So maybe you can think of it as this way. We went from the gold standard. All goods and services have supply and demand and money is no different. Quantity money demand is the amount of money that people and firms choose to hold. 
people have money in their wallets, coins in their pockets, maybe in, even in between their car seats. Firms have petty cash drawers. Both have checking accounts. And they do that because there's a benefit to holding money. The more money you hold, the easier it is for you to pay for things. So it's kind of a convenience thing. However, the marginal benefit of holding money decreases as the quantity of money held increases. For example, if you, when you go to work, you may only want to hold 50 bucks in your pocket because you know you might go out to lunch with a client, maybe get a cup of coffee at work. So there's there's a huge benefit to holding, you know, 40 or 50 dollars in your wallet. However, compare that to the same guy holding five thousand dollars in his wallet. Well, there's not much added benefit to holding going from 50 bucks in your wallet to five thousand. I mean, most people aren't going to blow five thousand dollars on a lunch. Uh, they're not going to even blow maybe a hundred dollars on a lunch. So there's there's not much a benefit of of going from say 50 to five thousand. But it's kind of nice to have you know forty fifty dollars in your pocket. Now there's also an opportunity cost of holding money, which is the interest foregone on an alternative asset. The opportunity, co the opportunity cost of holding money is the nominal interest rate because of the sum of the interest rate on an alternative asset plus the expected inflation rate, which is the rate at which money loses buying power. So rather than holding the money in your wallet, you could have kept it in a bank earning interest. The demand for money is a relationship between the quantity of money demanded and the nominal interest rate, holding everything else constant. The lower the nominal interest rate, the lower the opportunity cost of holding money. If interest rates are high, like they are at this point here, you probably don't want to hold any money in your wallet or have lots of petty cash in the uh, petty cash drawer. However, when interest rates fall, you're probably get more likely to hold money. So, the quantity of money goes from M0 out to M1. Shifters of money demand include the price level. If prices are going up, holding everything else constant, you need more wallet, money in your wallet. For example, if you like having a Coca-Cola before work every day, or a cup of coffee that costs a dollar, if all of a sudden a cup of coffee costs two dollars. Well, each day you go to work, you need at least two dollars in your pocket. Before you only needed one, now you need two. So generally speaking, the quantity of money held M rises by X percent, say ten percent, if the price level rises by the same percentage. Another shift of money demand is real GDP. If real GDP is growing, our incomes are going up, and we can afford to hold more money in our pocket. Financial technology also shifts money demand. The uh, growth in ATM machines, the popularity of debit cards, and banks paying interest on checking increases the demand of cards, reduce the demand for money. The nominal interest rate is the only influence on the quantity of money demanded that is free to fluctuate to achieve money market equilibrium. In the money market we have money demand, which is downward sloping, money supply, which is perfectly inelastic, a vertical line. The nominal interest rate is determined by the intersection of money supply and money demand. When the nominal interest rate is above its equilibrium level, the quantity of money supplied M subscript zero exceeds the quantity of money demanded M subscript one. People hold too much money, so they try to get rid of it by buying other financial assets like CDs and bonds. The demand for financial assets increases, the prices of these assets rise, 
and the interest rate falls. When the interest rate is below its equilibrium level, the quantity of money demanded, M subscript 1, exceeds the quantity of money supplied, M subscript 0. People are holding too little money, so they try to get more money by selling other financial assets like CDs and bonds. Demand for financial assets decreases, the prices of these assets fall, and the interest rate rises.